Our next speaker is Ben Marcy Quay. He is a PhD student at Harvard University, and he will be speaking today about uh, handling time biases, or how handling time biases kind of one electric fishing kept forever. Thanks, Kurt. So I've never realized I could say this before, but you're welcome to live stream my talk as well. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't have a lot of fancy pictures. In fact, I have a lot of equations. So I decided to start off with a bit of a video instead. Uh, but before I do that, just show of hands, who here has used electric fishing before as part of your research? All right, and keep your hand up if you've used bone electric fishing, not just straight. Awesome, great. I've got an enthusiastic audience. I don't have to go over all the bases. <laughs> Now, I hope that this works. Excellent. So I just want to start off with a picture of us doing some electric fishing in the Adirondacks. Uh, we use a modified pontoon boat. <coughs> we do pull-ins based on all the wood and other debris we have along the shoreline. Uh, and our technique is we come into shore, we net all the fish that we see, um, and we keep a running timer on our Smith root unit. Uh, and as you can see, and as you probably know from experience, a lot of times netting all the fish is kind of a, a time intensive effort. You know, you, you see, you turn on the juice and you see 20, 30 fish. Uh, and you have to catch up all those. Maybe there's sculpins kind of stuck in the rocks. Uh, it can take a lot of time. And that's, that's what this whole talk is going to revolve around. Other times, you know, you come up to a site and maybe there's one fish. You, know, you might look around, it takes you a few seconds to say, like, is that all the fish? Is there anything else hiding out there? Uh, but it can really vary depending on what the habitat is and where you are. Uh, and that turns out that that matters. So I'll start off with the problem. We all use catch the unit effort, uh, extremely prevalent measure of relative abundance. And in most cases, effort is time. Now in electric fishing literature, that actually is not always the case. Sometimes it's space. Um, but for the next several slides, I'm going to talk about it meaning time and a general effort in seconds. And for most techniques, that works really well. The handling effort, the time it takes to you know, untangle the fish from the gill net or get it out of the trap net, uh, doesn't have anything to do with your sampling effort. You know, when you start pulling your gill net out of the water, that soak time is over, no matter if you caught one fish or 20 fish. Uh, same with the trawl. You stop pulling that, you stop collecting fish. And it doesn't matter what's in that trawl. But that's actually not the case for electric fishing. Now there's two ways to measure time. There's a way I talked about where you do total time, uh, you keep the counter running, you wait until all the fish have been netted, uh, maybe you try and keep a constant speed. The other way is you do set transects. So you say, we're gonna fish for 10 minutes. We will get all the fish we can get in 10 minutes, and when that's up, we stop. Now even if there's some fish floating over there, that's, that's not part of it. Now, netting isn't an instantaneous process, as you're probably very familiar with. Uh, so this former one here actually can lead to gear saturation. If you choose your time poorly, you've got some fish floating around at the end, those weren't recorded in your study. You, if you have 200 fish floating afterwards, or 10 fish floating afterwards, it doesn't matter. They weren't part of the transect, wasn't recorded. What isn't as recognized in the literature <coughs> is that this latter one, keeping the clock running, doing a continuous and a variable time, leads to something I'm calling effort inflation. So what, what do I mean by that? Well, I'm going to start off with a bunch of equations, everybody's favorite thing. Uh, and this one we're all familiar with, catch the internet effort, catch over effort. And oftentimes this is broken out into catchability, the probability that an individual fish is caught multiplied by abundance. And this is why we can use catch period effort as a relative measure of abundance. But you can actually break up effort a little bit farther for electric fishing. You've got search effort. This is the time it would take to go <coughs> into the site and say, there's no fish here. And along with handling effort, the time it takes to net up all the fish. And these two things sometimes overlap. If there's one or two fish, you can pick them up whilst convincing yourself that 
you've gotten all the fish out of that site. Uh, but other times when you've got a bunch of fish down there, a bunch of sculpins stuck in rocks, this handling effort becomes a big deal. And since handling effort is based on the number of fish you catch, we can actually substitute in this upper piece down in here. It's just the number of fish multiplied by some sort of handling time. And what happens is that when this number of fish caught is pretty low, this looks like our standard equation. It's just this right up here. But if you catch a lot of fish, this can dominate. And what this actually means is we have a catch metered effort that approaches a constant. And that's what this looks like. And you, you may recognize this kind of a figure if you've ever read any of the literature about hyperstability. So while your catch is increasing steadily down here, your CPUE is leveling off. And this can be a big deal. You know, say you catch 100 fish one year, your CPUE is right up here. The next year you go back, you catch 50 fish. All right, not too big of a deal. Catch me effort is kind of the same. But you just lost 50% of your catch. And you go back the year after that, and all of a sudden you're down here. Things were stable, and then it fell off really fast. So understanding this process is really important. Let's see where I'm at. All right, so that's the theory. But how can we actually look at this? Can we use our data to, to prove this or show some evidence for it? Uh, luckily, we've been doing standardized boat electric fishing on two lakes for really the better part of two decades. Uh, this was started by Brian Weidel. Um, and at this point, throwing off some of the earlier years to make sure everything's standard, we've got over a thousand site sampling occasion combinations. So we've got a pretty strong data set to look at this. And it would be nice if we could measure handling time directly, if we could put a value to that. Uh, but this isn't actually very useful, and it's pretty difficult, because handling time is going to vary depending on the habitat, the species of fish, uh, it actually varies a lot depending on who's actually doing the netting. Um, the equipment, the geometry of the boat, what kind of scat you're using. So even if we could come up with a value, it's not applicable to anything other than our specific situation. Instead, I'm going to focus on simply proving that this is happening. Uh, because it turns out that while it's kind of a common sense thing, there's almost nothing written about this in the literature specifically. I found one paper about 10, 15 years ago that simply says in the discussion, but of course we don't use time because that's completely biased. And then everything since then hasn't referred to that and a lot of it has used time. Uh, so it, it's kind of amazing when I start thinking about this that this is still happening, we're all still doing this. Uh, so what I did is I used an a priori set of GLM models uh, and I want to use AIC to simply compare the fish. I fit a model to it, and I see which model gives me the best results and also the most parsimonious. Uh, some of the factors I used were site length. I included this in every model because the shoreline length of the site is going to be the best predictor of how much time it takes to survey it. Catch, number of fish. The driver, this is kind of one of our things where we say, okay, well, we say we standardize, but maybe we don't. So including driver, if there's a really strong effect of driver that says, okay, maybe our standardization is off. The habitat, does it matter that if we're picking them off a sandy bottom versus a bunch of rock and wood? Uh, and the sampling occasion. This is another thing saying, okay, maybe we're not standardizing. If sampling occasion is really strong, you know, there's always going to be some variation, and this is kind of, it's collinear a bit with catch and some other things, uh, but including that in there, seeing what are the strongest predictors. And what I got is a giant table that you really don't want to read through, but I wanted to post results. And what I'll highlight is that all of these top models include catch. Everything falls out right there. Uh, there's a pretty strong difference between the first two and everything else, about 50 AIC units. And in AIC, anything above, the difference of above two is considered to be significant. Um, and anything above about 10, that model really isn't worth considering with the others. Uh, and these top two have a difference of three. And this is the difference between driver and no driver. Uh, so it's saying that while it is helpful to add more data to the model, uh, that probably driver is the weakest thing to predict what's happening. And the strongest one is catch. 
These are some predictions from the model that is showing that as catch goes up, effort goes up. And then when you combine those predictions with the effort to get a catch per unit effort, you're seeing pretty much that exact theoretical figure that I showed you earlier. Um, but, okay, so catch is driving effort. That's what I'm trying to prove to you. But what if instead effort is driving catch, that we're not standardizing well, and we're just simply spending more time, and we weren't getting all the fish before, where we put in more effort, and we get more fish? Well, if that's the case, we would expect that in shorter sites, it wouldn't be a strong relationship. You have diminishing returns. You're not going to sit there with your boat on and have all the fish from the entire lake flock to it, and you're slowly the lake. That in a short site, more effort isn't worth as much. Whereas in larger sites, more effort leads to greater catch. If it's going that way. Well, we've got an interaction term, and what we see is the opposite. So this is catch along the bottom, effort along the y-axis, and then these are four different lines here for different site lengths. Darker site lengths being longer. The longer the site length, the weaker the relationship is between catch and effort. And this is what I was talking about earlier, where handling effort can be part of search effort if the catch is low. That when you've got a site that's 8,000 meters long, or 9,000, sorry, 900 meters long, which is pretty rare for our data set, but I'm just pushing this model out there so you can really see the differences, that it doesn't matter if you're catching 50 fish or 200 fish, your effort's pretty constant. But if it's a really small site, the number of fish you catch is greatly going to affect the effort you realize. Okay, so what are some of the, the implications for this? Well, this is some of our raw data looking at whole length total catch versus total effort. Uh, this is fish per second, catch per unit effort, and you see it's bouncing around. There's not much happening between 2005 and 2015. I don't really see much of a trend. What if you do that versus site length, fish per meter? This looks to me like a much stronger trend. This is telling me that around 2010, something may have happened with the lake, with the fish community, with the productivity, but we would have missed that if we were just looking at it by effort. And that's because the site length didn't change, but the effort we saw realized did. This also affects single species metrics. If you're trying to do a single species catch metered effort, that effort denominator is going to be affected by all the species. So you could be catching two lake trout one year or two lake trout the next year, but if on that second year you also caught 100 smallmouth bass, you betcha it's going to take much more time to catch all of that. And what's going to happen is your lake trout catch metered effort is going to drop, even though you caught the same number in the same site. Uh, so this is looking at white suckers, single site. You see kind of a downward trend here. You know, if I was really caring about white suckers, which most people don't, this would be maybe some worrisome thing. But if you look at, once again, fish per 100 meters, nothing changed in there. This 50% drop, no, same number of fish. So this affects everything. This, this could affect management decisions if you're basing them on cash standard effort. So how much does this matter? Are we just you know, one lab that's kind of screwing things up? What's the scope of this issue? Well, I went back through and looked at 58 electric fishing papers from the last six years. Um, just went on Web of Science, a couple of boat electric fishing you know, search terms, picked out every paper that could kind of tell me what was, what was their measure of catch metered effort. And I found that 79% of them used time as their measure of effort. And a third of the total used a non-fixed time. They weren't using set transects. That's a massive number of studies. You know, I got papers from all over the world. And even in New York, the DEC does over 100 waters a year for surveys. So this is a big deal. This is 20, 30 years of data that may or may not have some biases in it based on the handling. And when you think about it, it it's intuitive. It makes sense. But we've also missed this. So what are the solutions for it? Well, the best thing to do is to ignore time completely. Use space. It's independent of how many fish you have to net. And it's a reasonable approximation of the habitat survey. Uh, this is done in most studies currently by shoreline length. 
The problems with it is it doesn't represent features such as shoals or points or docks well. There's habitat that's missed by a simple linear measure. Uh, and if you have a lake that drops off really suddenly versus a lake that is really shallow for a long time, shoreline length may not standardize between them. Uh, so I'm arguing for an even better measure. And if you know me, you'll probably guess it's a little bit technological. Um, but instead, we can interface a GPS with the equipment. Let's record points where we're electrofishing and get a real measure of area survey. Uh, this has accurate records. It has time in there. You can actually compute speed from this. So if you're trying to keep a constant speed, you can use this to standardize by that. You can figure out if you're slowing down or speeding up. And if you're drifting, if there's a lot of wind, if you're looping back, you can account for that. So I've built a unit that does that. I have one field season so far where I've got actual data everywhere we surveyed, and I'm hoping to build that data center over the next couple of years, and maybe we can talk to you in a little bit and be able to give you hard data on how this compares to other metrics. With that, I'd like to thank everybody involved, a uh, ton of people, many of them in this room, in this building, uh, and actually with any 15-year project, you know, there's so many people involved. Thank all of them, uh, and actually the craft manager, and that. Take questions. <laughs> so the question is, could I patent the device I made? Has that already been done? Uh, I haven't looked into it. With most of the stuff I make, I tend to think that the idea isn't that novel. It's just the implementation. I use a lot of open source, kind of low-cost hardware and the do-it-yourself side of things. Um, so I haven't looked into that too much, and honestly, I like science. I'm not being rich. I don't want to manage business. Yeah. But it's an interesting thought. Open source plans. No? Anything else? Um, yeah, it's when you did the uh, set transect line, were you doing a steady speed throughout the line, or was that like your searching pattern where you put just your speed based on the so we don't do the set transcend links. We do continuously recording just to see what the, what the variable effort is at the end of it. Um, with set transects, you can do it a couple of different ways. I would argue that if you use a set speed, then you're running into gear saturation throughout the transect because if fish are clustered, clumped, then you miss the larger clusters. If you're doing a set time, but willing to slow down to get all the fish you see, then you'll run into saturation if your transit length is long enough, but clumping won't affect that. Uh, it's, it's a trade-off either way, and I know it, it seems like every, every group has their own way of doing things. I've talked to some people who are do, doing this for a long time, and they say, well, you know, I moved from Florida to Wisconsin, and we completely changed methods because they believe this is the right way. Um, and it's real for everything, but I would argue that space is the best way. Capture all the fish you see and divide that by area.